again, this is Mr. Fly here, hope you're well. A week later than it should be, but it's time to do another one of my monthly news reviews. If you've not been keeping up to date with the UK biking press over the last month, the month of July 2018, then stick around, stay tuned, I'll tell you what you've missed. Okay, so I've got uh, five copies of Motorcycle News to go through here with a number of articles that I've highlighted. Uh, I haven't actually done today's uh, copy just because, as I mentioned uh, just now, I'm a bit out of sync with these reviews. I've been away for the last couple of weeks on a bike tour, of which more another time. Um, so uh, I wasn't able to do the bike review at the normal time last, last week. So uh, as I say, five copies to go through. Uh, grab yourself a brew. This could be a long video. All right, then, let's start off with the... Um, first paper and the first story that I picked out. Now this was the paper that was back in uh, Wednesday, July the 4th, so well over a month ago now. So some of this news is starting to get old, but you may have missed it if you've not been keeping up to date with the press. So first thing I picked out here is this, KTM confirm hot new 790. And this is the um, 790 adventure that we've been talking about for a while now. Uh, a bike that I think could absolutely hit the sweet spot uh, of adventure bikes, because let's face it, big old uh, adventure bikes like the um, uh, the Super, not the Super Duke, the KTM Super Adventure, the GS, uh, the Multistrada, the big Multistrada, etc. They're all lovely bikes, but they don't half weigh a lot. And, uh, you know, whilst they're good on motorways and cruising and stuff, not necessarily great off-road compared to smaller versions. So KTM uh, have come out with this 790 Adventure, which is based on the Duke 790 engine. I rode the Duke 790 recently. It was a fantastic bike, great engine. And stick it in an adventure frame, I think it would be amazing. So anyway, it's now official. KTM sets happening. And a bit later on the review, we're going to talk a bit more about that because uh, some of them are broken cover and some journalists have ridden them now. So more on that in a minute. But uh, I think that could well be the sweet spot for the adventure bike market. Okay, next story here. The Cub is back. Do you remember this? The uh, the Honda Cub. Now this is uh, notable because this is the bike, or in fact this is the vehicle that's been more ubiquitous than any other vehicle ever made. It's something like uh, 100 million of these. In fact, that's what the figure is. I made a note. 100 million of these have been made over the years up until now. Uh, and now it's been revamped and rejigged and will be relaunched in Western markets. So you'll be able to buy a new 125 Cub. Uh, in the coming years. Um, it um, puts out 9.5 bhp, so very low power, but it is what it is. But the uh, upside of that is, of course, if you're using it for um, city transport, they're saying you're going to get 188 miles per gallon out of it, and MCN reckon it's going to cost around £2,000. I mean, that is you know, practical, cheap transport, isn't it? If you're in the city, instead of buying a bus pass or a train season ticket, two grand, get you one of these bikes and you'll get 188 miles per gallon out of it, maybe. Anyway, it's an iconic machine. Uh, looking forward to seeing what the bike comes out like. I'm glad they kept this sort of original look of the bike, albeit they've brought it well up to date with things like LED headlights and stuff like that. So really interesting to see what that looks like when it comes out and indeed how well it sells. Will it sell another 100 million? Somehow I doubt, but you never know. Certainly not in the UK it won't. All right, next up. Here we go. This is a story about uh, the police hitting back at bike crime. As uh, we've discussed many times here before, uh, bike crime has become a real issue, particularly in London, but throughout big cities in the UK. Uh, well, the police are now seem to be taking a much more proactive stance. We'll talk again more about this later on in the review. But this particular article I was keen to point out is because what they've been doing, or allegedly the uh, Metropolitan Police haven't confirmed or denied this, but some people have seen this going on, is the police have got themselves a couple of Honda CRF 250Ls, a bike I'm very keen on, I own one myself. Uh, they've been going out in plain clothes um, on the CRFs and when they've seen um, people that look like they're going to commit a crime on mopeds um, because there are some telltale signs of what these people are doing uh, they'll actually go and apprehend them and that's what they've been doing as I say the uh, Metropolitan Police haven't actually confirmed this but it seems that's the case uh, because there's been some footage showing that the police on the bikes actually stopping scooter suspects so Brilliant news that they're actually doing this now. Um, we've, you know, in the past they've been afraid to take action because of uh, fears for their own job and what reprisals might happen in terms of, you know, impact on their own livelihood. Um, but now it seems they're they're, you know, boosted by the Home Secretary saying that you know they should go after these people, helmet wearing or not, and that it seems they are actually doing that. So great news. Um, hopefully, um, you know, that's gonna that's gonna make a difference. We'll talk a bit more about bike crime again in a minute and in a further article. Okay, and then last but not least. From this, um, from the first paper, uh, the 790 Duke is always up for it. This is kind of a summary that Tim Thompson, one of MCN's reporters, uh, has given of the bike. He's got the 790 Duke as his um, long-term loaner, which they had for sort of eight or nine months of the year, uh, and he absolutely loves it. And the thing that I thought summed this up, having ridden this for a few weeks myself, at the end he said. Uh, 
it's up for every, every time. What, wherever it, it, well, sorry, let's do this again. Wherever it is and whatever it does, it just loves being a motorbike. And I think that sums it up. It's like a, it's like a happy puppy, this bike. Again, it's in that sweet spot of um, size and capacity for use on the road. 790cc, brilliant. Loads of power, ample for overtakes, ample for fun, uh, but not so big that you can get yourself into lots of trouble very, very quickly. And also it's not super heavy either. It's a great fun bike. It's doing the rounds at the moment. You can see all sorts of people riding these at the moment. Uh, KTM have been lending them out left, right and centre, including to me, which I'm really happy about. Uh, and it is a lovely, lovely bike. The only thing is, the looks just don't do it for me. Um, the Super Duke R, I think, looks nicer. Even that, though, I don't think, well, in fact, there's a picture there. I think it looks better, but it's not, it's still not a looker, is it? In fact, none of the KTMs that I can think of are lookers, which is a real shame, because all the KTMs, bar one, I've ridden have been fantastic bikes. Um, so, yeah, if they can get a new designer in to do something about the looks, that would be great. But I do like the headlights that they have now. I love the Super Duke R generally, uh, but the 790 is probably the more practical bike, and, uh, and MCN, or at least Tim Thompson, seem to agree. All right, that's it for the first paper. Boy, it's hot in here. It's, uh, it's about 30 degrees outside today, and uh, I've got the windows closed because it's actually hotter outside than in, and these lights pump out loads of heat, so uh, I'm absolutely cooking, hence the water. Anyway, I'm not really complaining because this summer has been cracking, isn't it? Okay, next paper then. Uh, first story in this one, uh, Fantic 500 delivers. Now this is a new bike from the uh, company Caballero, which are either, I think they're Italian, uh, but they could be Spanish, I'm not sure. Um, but this is another of these retro styled scrambler bikes. And uh, we've seen a few of these in the past from the likes of um, Mutt and so on, but they've all tended to be 125cc bikes. This one is actually a, um, 250, uh, sorry, 500 cc machine. So, uh, which just sounds like a lot more usable power. It still has a Chinese engine, not necessarily a bad thing. These engines are often based on previously bulletproof, well-proven um, engines, uh, probably in this case, an, an old Suzuki engine. Um, but the styling of it is spot on as a scrambler. Um, and uh, Michael Neves rode this. He's my favorite uh, tester at MCN. Uh, and he seemed to think it was absolutely brilliant. So uh, 500 cc for one of these, it's available in the scrambler type or flat tracker. Um, and it is available, or is going to be available this year. Don't think it says how much it's going to cost, but I can't imagine it's going to be super expensive. But uh, 43 bhp, 145 kilograms. I think it just looks amazing. So uh, yeah, let's hope uh, that does all right, and we actually get a few in the country, and we can actually get a look and a play on those. I think it looks absolutely mint, and uh, 500 cc, I think, will be perfect size for a bike of that type. So there we go. That's the uh, that's the Fantic Caballero Fantic. Okay, I couldn't go through this paper without mentioning the, the tragic uh, loss of William Dunlop, yet another uh, member of the Dunlop family um, killed on bikes. This was the Scaries 100 a few weeks ago now. He was only 32, leaves a wife and uh, at least one child, I think. Absolutely tragic. Um, not really much more I can say about that. I just didn't think I could go through the review and not mention it. So um, road racing, I mean, it's a great spectacle. We all enjoy watching it, but uh, you know, it is dangerous. The guys concerned go into it knowing what they're doing, but nonetheless, it doesn't lessen the blow whenever somebody dies. So, um, you know, thoughts go out to the Dunlop family yet again. Okay, brighter note. Well, this is, a, is an interesting story. Um, MCN have been running this thing um, for the last, I don't know, five or six months called the MCN 5000. They're trying to encourage people to get on their bikes more and go and ride, and that's, that's great. I see no reason why we shouldn't do that, so that's good. And they do little spotlights on people that have joined in the, the fun and done their 5,000 miles this year. And this particular chap, um, he's done an epic, um, journey that was 1029 miles in a day so i'm not picking on him or, or, or commenting particularly on this particular ride i'm just thinking is a thousand miles in a day actually a sensible idea i've just got back from a big uh, a big tour myself i've been away for the last uh, 16 days riding up to the arctic circle and there'll be much more on that soon on the channel um and you know we did it's quite hard riding um and we we're on the bike maybe 12 hours a day we maybe only covered three to four hundred miles because as i say the riding was quite tough in places this i'm not sure what this thousand miles was but I was absolutely whacked at the end of those days um, so I can't imagine what doing a thousand miles in a day is like I just think if I did it I'd be very tired and I think after about 500 I would be dropping off to sleep on the bike so not sure it's sensible to encourage people to do such high miles um, just wonder what your thoughts on that were what's the most miles you've ever done down a bike and uh, do you think it's a good idea um, and why do it as well I mean you're not you're just going to be on the bike all the time Pfft. I'm not sure it's fun doing such big miles, to be honest. Looks like he did it on a GS as well, so good choice of bike. But anyway, what do you think about these high mileage days? Worth doing or not? Personally, anything over about 200 miles in a day, and I've had enough, and I'm looking for my hotel. But maybe it's just me being a bit of a wimp. All right, next story. Honda UK offer free trackers. Now, this is a great 
story on the surface of it. New bike bars can benefit from a scheme to beat thieves. Uh, now, basically, the, the idea is that trackers, um, I'm sure you know what they are, but they've, been, they've proven very uh, effective at allowing people to recover their bikes when they've been stolen. I've got trackers fitted on all my bikes. Um, and it's great that Honda now have started to fit these things. They're quite expensive, um, sort of 400 quid a pop, so they don't include them in the bike. The problem is, of course, you then have to pay the 120 pounds per year subscription to keep them active, which although they're great gadgets, that's a lot of money, isn't it? So um, so on the surface of it, great story, well done Honda for doing that, but £120 a year for the subscription is a bit salty, particularly if you've got more than one bike, I think, uh, says the man that's got four bikes and four trackers, so I know how expensive it is. What I've done, I've got um, two of these expensive type trackers on my expensive, two expensive bikes, on my other bikes, I've now got the Minimoto tracker, or the Monimoto tracker, sorry, I'll stick a link below, which only costs around £100, and then the subscription is marginal, it's about, I think, £15 a year or something, it's absolutely marginal. I've done a review on this. Check those out. If you're interested in a tracker, I wholeheartedly heartily recommend you do get a tracker fit into your bike because they do help recover your machine. But you don't have to go buying the ones that cost £120 a year. You can get the Monimoto and uh, and, you're, and you're good at just a few pounds a year. So uh, anyway, that's my thoughts on that. Well done Honda, but you know maybe give a Monimo Monimoto, not the expensive trackers. Okay, next. Oh, I just <laughs> I only mentioned this because there's a cracking blog off uh, article in this particular paper this uh, this this week um, mainly because the uh, you know the photographs of the fellow included look particularly handsome. Anyway, we'll swiftly move on. Okay, last but not least uh, in this week's paper, um, MCN in their big test have pitted the uh, two big nakeds up together: the Triumph Speed Triple and the Honda CB Thousand R. Um, I was just quite interested to see what they thought of this because I've had uh, I've had no experience with the CB Thousand R. I want to ride one, just haven't been able to sort it out yet. But I do want to do that. But I have ridden the Speed Triple, and I'm a huge Triumph fan. So it's very interesting to see how this came out. And I will ride the CB Thousand R at some point in the future. MCN's verdict was that the uh, Speed Triple still has it. They gave the Speed Triple four stars and the uh, Honda three stars. Um, personally, I think the Speed Triple looks a nicer bike, but something about the new Honda that I find quite intriguing. You know, it looks sort of um, neo-modern, if that makes sense. Not sure about the radiator on it, but otherwise I quite like the looks of it. But uh, yeah, it will be really interesting to have a go at that. Um, just checking down here to see what they say is what the difference was. Um, Basically, the, they're saying that the street triple, or sorry, whoops, the speed triple is uh, smoother, grippier, more agile, and easier to ride. Um, although it is a little bit more expensive by about a grand, I think. Yeah, it's about a thousand pound more expensive, but it's a better bike according to MCM. I'll have a ride, see what I think. All right, that's the second paper. Next up, paper number three, and I've only got three stories that I've pulled out of here. Uh, just so you can keep up, this is the one from July the 18th. All righty, now this story here, um, Levis return with Brutal V6. Uh, I think it's pronounced Levis, not Levi's. Uh, and I believe this is a British manufacturer. Um, it's, a, it's a company that used to be around years ago, 1920, I think. Uh, yeah, they took a win at the Isle of Man in 1920. The name's been revived by some entrepreneurial uh, people. Um, and they're going to produce this new bike. Now, the reason I highlighted this is that this bike costs £78,000. Although they're expecting it to cost £78,000, which is a nuts amount of money, isn't it? I bought properties for less money than that in the past. My first flat, I think it was 50,000 pounds when I first bought myself a place to live. Anyway, um, 78 grand for a bike. And to be honest, whilst I encourage these um, um, brands being revived, it's a great thing. This one, it just doesn't even look very nice to me. It's got, it's, a, it's an interesting style. It's sort of um, almost uh, sort of art deco. It's, it's more like art than an actual bike. Uh, and I assume that the people that buy these will end up just um, not actually riding them anyway, but put, putting them somewhere as a piece of art. But uh, do you, is it just me? Do you like the look of this Levis or is it just a not a nice looking bit of kit? I'm sorry yet, guys, but just don't like that. It's a V6. Uh, they think it's going to sound like three Harleys firing together, which would be something to hear and see, wouldn't it? But uh, I don't know, it just doesn't do it for me. Who on earth buys these? 78 grand for an ugly looking bike. Hmm? Okay, <laughs> I'd be interested to see if you agree or disagree with me on that. Uh, next here, tough tax tactics have an impact. I said we're coming back to the bike crime thing, and this is a follow-up story. Turns out the police are calling this crackdown on scooter crime, um, Operation Venice, and it is having an impact. And on figures that they've recorded over the last year, apparently in May, um, they've seen a 55% reduction in scooter crimes for May, this May versus last May, uh, which seems to indicate that things are going well. So that's fantastic news, if that's the case. Having said that, if you look at the overall picture for the whole year, we're still way up on bike crimes. We're looking at, at the moment, 400 committed per week versus 280 committed 
for the previous year. That's sort of average across the year. But uh, in the main, the police are saying that these new taxes are starting to have an effect. So thumbs up there. Let's hope that continues. Alrighty. Uh, next off, oh, another blog off article I want to mention. This is um, Al Fagan from 44 Teeth. I don't know if you've seen his articles that he writes uh, in blog off every four weeks. Uh, he was talking here, this one was interesting because he was talking about um, track days and how nutters can spoil all the fun. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why I haven't done a track day recently because um, well, number one, insurance is quite expensive to get your bike insured for a track day if it's not included in your insurance. Um, and then if you decide not to have insurance, which a lot of people do, then you, you risk trashing your bike, don't you? And it's not that you're going to come off. You can ride really carefully and ride around and do your own thing. But there are nutters out there that could come and, and you know just take you out from the side. And suddenly you've, you, your bike's been trashed and you've got no insurance. So completely agree with Al Fagan on this. Um, Idiots that don't follow the rules at track days um, can really spoil the fun for all of us. It's sort of spoiled it for me already because I'm, as I say, I haven't done a track day. Uh, that for in the last year. That said, I'm not saying I'm never going to do one again. I, I definitely will because I just think they improve your road riding. Um, but yeah, just um, you know, take it easy out there on the tracks, guys. It is meant to be fun. Um, you know, just there are people of all sorts of abilities out there. Just give people a wide berth and abide by the rules in the briefing is all I'd say. But good article by Al Fagan there. All right, that's it. There was only three I picked out from that paper. Wow, it's not getting any cooler in here. Next, I'm going to come to some parish notices at the end as well, by the way, so just stand by for those. So this paper here, first story I picked out, New Diavel is cornering king. And this here that got me all excited when I saw this picture, because this is a new uh, Ducati Diavel that is expected um, next year, I think it is. Um, it's based on the 1260 engine from the big new Multistrada, uh, and it's been slightly redesigned. It looks a bit more like the um, X Diavel, which I've yet to ride as well, but I love the looks of that. Um, so a new revamped Diavel. I love the Diavel. I just think I love the idea of the concept of a cruiser, but actually goes like a sports bike. I was a bit um, disappointed to see when I read the article that actually this picture is a mo one of the MCN mock-ups. They're very good at doing these mock-ups. They, they um, have an educated guess as to what the bike is going to look like. And more often than not, they're quite close. So I imagine it will look quite like this, but this isn't the actual bike. And yeah, available in 2019. So uh, that could be one that perhaps again we see at the shows this uh, this winter, NEC show, perhaps we'll see a new um, Diablo 150 um, BHP Olins forks and shocks, launch control, quick shifter, all that sort of stuff. So, uh, you know, going to be loaded. That's going to be one well worth seeing. Okay, I mentioned we'd talk a bit more about the um, KTM 790 Adventure. Now it's broken cover. Um, there was actually some sort of press launch or press ride of this a few weeks back and a number of journos got to go and ride it. Uh, and they all reported that it was an excellent machine. Surprise, surprise, they've been at wind and dined by KTM for a few days. Uh, oh, is that me being cynical? But all I was gonna mention here is now we've seen it at different angles. I'm sure it is a nice, nice bike to ride. What do you think to the looks of it? It's sort of half enduro bike, half normal KTM adventure mashed together. And once again, I just don't think the design works. Particularly when you see it from the side, that front headlight, as much as I like the design of the KTM insectoid headlight, it's just poking out from the front too far. It just, just doesn't work for me, which is a real shame because that's the sort of bike that I think absolutely hits the sweet spot, as I mentioned before, in terms of its size and weight for doing uh, serious touring and off-road work. It could do it all. It would be brilliant. But if a bike doesn't grab you by the way it looks, you ain't gonna buy it, are you? So uh, once again, I think, um, Possibly a good bike let down just by its looks, which is a shame. Maybe it's just me that's superficial like that. But again, I'd be interested to hear what your thoughts are. One, do you think it's an attractive looking bike? And two, how much influence does what a bike looks like have on you when you actually buy one? I think this is why the Ducatis of the world do so well. They don't necessarily have a great reputation uh, for reliability and stuff like that, but they look so good, people buy them. Alrighty, uh, moving on swiftly. F850 GS, another case in point. This is the bike that... Um, Again, I've ridden recently, and I've got a review up. You may want to see that if you haven't done. And I really rated the bike as a rider's bike. It feels exactly like um, the big GS, the 1200 that I've got. Um, but it just has something about the looks don't quite do it. It's, um, I think, mainly because the screen's so small. If you put a bigger screen on, it might look a bit better. But if the looks don't grab you, you're not going to buy it. Having said that, I think with a bigger screen, this would look a lot better. And it did ride absolutely beautifully when I rode it. Uh, and Michael Neves here, I quite like what he said about here was... Um, he said, uh, if the R1200 GS would, would be even better than it is if it was, say, 15 kilograms lighter, slightly cheaper, a um, bit slimmer, uh, but still loaded with all the goodies that it's got. And basically, that's what you get with the F850. It's, it feels just like the big 1200 when you're on it in terms of its seating position, lofty riding position. It goes really well. Um, if they could just do something with the screen and maybe the beep to make it look a bit more serious, well, not serious, but a bit more attractive to my eye at least, then I think I'd probably go for one of them when my 1200 is up. Uh, but although it's hopefully still got a lot of life in it yet. So do like the F850 GS, but again, just styling doesn't quite hit the spot for me. The um, summary 
that uh, Neavesy came out with was uh, he thought it was it was great. Four out of five. I think it's five out of five. Ten thousand six hundred and fifty. This bike. You've got the fancy BMW TFT screen, which is one of the best TFTs I've seen on any bike. Um, and you've got pretty much all the utility of the big R1200 GS. So if you like the looks, this is the bike to have. It goes really well. It doesn't feel low power. Uh, it didn't feel any slower than the big GS to me. It definitely felt lighter and it's a lot cheaper. Uh, if you can get this for 10,650, no doubt you'll have to spec it up because that's what BMW do. But you could probably still get a fully spec one for 12 grand or something. If you want to go for a fully spec GS, you're near a 20 grand. So there we go. So that's the F850 GS. Be interested to see how that sells. Uh, and then just a quick one here. There's an article here about restoring, um, well, a modern classic in this case. And I was just, it's something I've sort of toyed with. I'm a, as I've probably mentioned before, a technical numpty when it comes to motorcycles. I keep keep well away from the properly technical jobs. I can do the basic stuff like oil changes, but that's about it. If it came to, you know, redoing a fork seal or something, I'm out of my depth or taking an engine out and putting it back in. It's not, I just can't do that stuff because I've never done it, don't know how to. But it does strike me a great way to learn about motorbikes is to do exactly that. Buy an old one, strip it down, clean that, put it back together again, maybe do some customization. So I was wondering as a sort of a winter project whether I should do that. Um, it's really down to time and money and space a bit, but it's something I would really like to do and wondered if you'd be interested in that. It would be a bit of bodgery, because um, as I say, I'm untrained, I don't know what I'm doing. It would be going along, stripping the thing down and really getting your, your guys, you guys advice on how to put the thing back together again. And as I came up against problems, getting advice from the interwebs and the community out there to help me out. So it would be uh, it might be quite interesting. But anyway, we'll see. But uh, let me know what you think to that idea. All right, so that was that. Let's just have a little fan. Goodness me. <sighs> Things I suffer for this art, eh? Right, another swig. All right, last paper before we get on to a couple of parish notices. First story in this paper, and this is last Wednesday's paper, not the one that's out today. Uh, I'll do that in the next review, just because, again, I'm slightly out of sync, but we'll catch up. Okay, the... Um, the first story in here is about these new Harleys that have come out, which is uh, seems to have not shocked but surprised everybody that they've come out with a whole raft of new models. And um, two two angles to this really. First of all, what do you think to these new models? Here's the first one. Look, it's like an adventure bike. Um, hats off to Harley for actually trying something new. Um, can't um, you know criticise them for that? But my goodness me, this one is straight out of the fugly tree, isn't it? That is a hideous looking machine in my eyes. We've talked a lot, or I've talked a lot about ugly bikes in this review. Well, that one's got to take the biscuit. No one surely is going to buy that in the UK, are they? It's just grim. Um, anyway, they've come out with an adventure bike type machine. They've got a Street Fighter uh, and they've updated some of their cruisers as well. But even the Street Fighter look, this naked weapon, does that look does that look nice to your eyes? It doesn't to me. So they might be technically much improved over the older Harleys that, let's face it, have a bit of a reputation of being old technology, old school. Um, so great to see them upgrading, great to see them doing an electric bike as well. But again, they just don't look good, do they? I mean, um, if a bike doesn't grab you uh, by you know the way it looks, then no one's going to buy them. That, coupled with the fact that now Harley have got this issue with the um, getting caught up in the trade dispute between the EU and Donald Trump and all that, the fact that Harley's going to be more expensive probably in the EU in coming years, are these new models going to be enough to keep them afloat? Apparently, the Europe, European market is their second biggest market outside of the US. And uh, personally, I can't see these new models um, keeping them you know ahead of the game. Uh, not not looking like the way they do. Anyway, I'm sorry to report that. Again, it's a bit, a bit, a bit of a negative review this one, isn't it? I do apologise. Let me know what you think on that. All right, next up. New monkey bike from Honda. Look at this. This is based on the uh, Honda, well, we call it the Grom, don't we? I think it's officially the MX125, something like that. But uh, they've relaunched, re-brought out the old favourite from the 70s and 80s, the monkey bike. And I just think it looks super cool. I think through, you know, riding this through London would be brilliant. I can't wait if I can. Uh, to get a go on one of these. It's quite hard actually to get goes on 125s because um, often dealers don't have test bikes because they're aimed at learner riders and they don't want learner riders to borrow new bikes and fall off and trash them. So quite tricky to get hold of, but if I can get hold of a monkey bike, love to have a ride on one. I just think it'd be hilarious. Um, some of the headline figures on it are incredible. So for example, 107 kilograms is how much it weighs. I mean, that's virtually nothing, isn't it? 107 kilograms, that's, you know, I nearly weigh that. Um, and it's uh, apparently the official figure is 189 miles per gallon. I don't suppose anybody's actually going to get that, but you might still get 120, 130. You don't get cheaper motoring than that, do you? That's just absolutely amazing. It's got ABS on it as well, and it's going to cost less than four grand. Um, so, which, I, let's face it, four grand is a fair amount of money for a 125, but uh, it's such a cool looking thing. Uh, yeah, be great if, uh, if I can get a go on one of those. Wonder what you thought of that as well. There's some videos now. MCN did a video, this guy actually riding around London uh, on it. It's worth seeing that if you haven't watched it. It's, uh, it just looks hilarious fun. Okay, and then the last story for this month, if you're still with me, is this one, which I thought was quite uh, 
quite funny. Cut price perfection is the title, and there's a picture of a Panigale V4, the basic model. And uh, it's just what amused me about this was the title, Cut Price Perfection, because this is a bike that costs £19,250. <laughs> so, um, yes, it's cut price when you compare it next to the um, Speciale, which is thirty-five grand, uh, or indeed the Panigale V4S, which is uh, five grand more than this, it's sort of twenty-five grand ish But uh, to call it cut price, I think, it must be tongue in cheek, but uh, what a lovely bike. I mean, the Panigale, I love it. I've not ridden the V4 yet, I've got to put that right. There's so many bikes now, aren't there, to ride. So little time to do it, but um, yeah, I must get to ride a V4 soon. But regardless, even if you went for the basic one, if you could afford the outrageous 20 grand, um, you're still going to have a fantastic bike, aren't you? I, I bet you, I, as a sort of rider, I'm basically a road rider, I wouldn't be able to tell the difference between this and probably the Speciale. Um, so I might as well get that one if I was going to get one. But 20 grand, to me, is still an awful lot of money for a motorcycle. Lovely though it is. Let's just wait five years and get some second hand. Although I imagine the second hand value is going to be holding up pretty well. All right, that's it for the papers. Goodness me. Just a couple of uh, parish notices I wanted to run by you uh, in case you uh, wanted to keep up with what's going on on the channel. Got some good exciting news coming up soon, but I'll tell you about that in another, uh, in another time, but something I'm working on. Um, first off, um, these papers, of course, I'm, I'm only just skimming the surface of them. If you're interested, do get yourself a subscription to MCN. I'm not allied to MCN in any way. I do write that little monthly blog off article with them, but I've, you know that's all I do. I'm not a journo. Um, they don't tell me what to do, vice versa. Um, but I am a fan of MCN, clearly. There's always good stuff to read in there. Lots of people criticise them, I think, but it's the way I keep up to date with the bike news. Um, get yourself a subscription. There's loads more in there. I've just got, pulled out some of the things that I found of interest. So. Uh, you know, get yourself a subscription if you haven't done so already, first thing. Oh, the other thing, next live stream. Um, again, because I'm a bit out of sync with the things that I normally do, my next live stream is gonna be next Wednesday, which is August the 15th, which is what I published, I think, on the last live stream. But it's not gonna be at eight o'clock um, UK time. It's gonna be at 3 p.m., so in the afternoon. I know it's not an ideal time for most people, but 3 p.m. Uh, next Wednesday, August the 15th, is gonna be the next live stream. So make a note of that if you would. It'd be great to have you live. Of course, if you miss it, it'll go up on YouTube and you can watch it as a uh, as a playback. But if nobody joins live, then of course I don't get the questions to do the Q&A and it'll be very short. So uh, it would be brilliant if you are around three o'clock uh, next Wednesday, do get onto YouTube, give me a shout, drop me questions. It would be great to talk to you. I love doing those live things, they're great fun. So that's next week. Um, and then, oh, for last but not least, oh, let's get that up again. Uh, must just say thank you very much to my sponsors for this video, Custom Fit Guards, the people that make the earplugs that I wear. Um, they they uh, actually sponsored this video and the live stream. So thanks to those guys for continuing your support with them. If you go to their website, uh, customfitguards.co.uk, you can actually get a, uh, a discount as well if you mention the code FLYER10. That was it, okie dokie. Bit of, uh, sorry again that it's been um, a bit out of sync, this particular review. I had a few people actually ask me, when is the um, news review coming up? So I'm kind of flattered that people remembered it was due. So uh, so there we go, that's it, uh, that's it for this month. We'll uh, try and get back on track again next month. Uh, assuming nothing strange happens in the in the meantime, um, and I look forward to speaking to you again soon. Until then, this has been the Mist and Fly. Cheerio.